Okay, brief disclaimer, this video will be a two-parter. We will deal with broadcasting, mass medium and television, mostly in a historic context. And the second uh, video that I will be uploading will deal with the question of the regulation of television by various examples. So please make sure to watch both videos because we will definitely talk about both of them in a way. I also don't know how long they'll be, but unfortunately I presume they will be very long, so um, I apologize in advance, to be fair. Um, but let's get started. Um, why do I say arm so often? Broadcasting followed up on print, the first automated mass medium, but broadcasting is in itself now being caught up in newer technologies that are bringing about a convergence and a blurring of mass and private media. Before offering an account of the past 80 years of the history of broadcasting, we need to isolate the distinctive characteristics and functions of broadcasting by locating it within the broader history of mass communication. We might begin with a pretty simple definition of mass communication, the sending of messages to a multitude of receivers. Its original mode was life, in the sense that receivers were in the presence of the sender, that is, within hearing or seeing distance. And usually in a space which, needing to be large enough to accommodate both parties, was most likely public. In these circumstances, mass communication was inevitably a kind of performance. So we might term this public space a theatre, even though it could accommodate almost any kind of message, be it political speeches, philosophical debates, religious rituals, educational lectures, storytellings, factual reports, spectator sports or circuses, as well as the, of course, more conventionally theatrical kinds of performance such as drama or light entertainment. In fact, if we look at a history of media as a whole, we can separate three more or less distinct phases. The first phase and primary media phase is basically just that. It is face-to-face -face communication without any technological support. It is men and media, basically, body dependent and effective only through voice and body language in public forums. The channel would be preachers, storytellers, poets, etc, etc. Before the advent of, li <laughs> of literacy, yeah, well, before the advent of printing, literacy was very rare and poetry's inherent acoustic features, for instance, of rhythm, of rhyme, suggests that it was intended to be recited to a number of listeners rather than silently read to oneself. This is also the case for theatre performances, which is why that most people will tell you it is better to watch a Shakespeare play instead of just reading it. In this phase, Knowledge, as well as stories, aren't written down, they are orally transmitted and distributed, which is also why knowledges become lost, because they cannot be fixed in time and in space. This is something that changes with the second phase, or the secondary media phase. So for several thousand years, writing had provided a way of fixing speech, of taking human utterances out of its natural, constantly dissolving element that is time and putting it into space where it could remain permanently accessible. What print did was to turn writing into a mass medium by allowing an indefinite number of copies of an utterance to be made. This secondary phase also means that technical help, while introduced, was mostly with the sign production, not so much with the sign recipients. So while printing helped the distribution and the fixing of knowledge, it did not help with literacy in that sense. Of course, writing existed well beforehand, but the technical means that were used, be it paper, ink, pens, etc., were definitely inferior to the printing press, which allowed utterances to be transmitted from the few to the many. And this secondary phase basically shows that media can be industrialized and is industrialized. Moreover, the massification entails the democratization of the product, to which it is applied in the sense of widening popular access to it. It is not just, perhaps not even primarily, the case that mass production meets in a pre-existing mass demand. Rather, that in order to justify itself economically, it must increase demand. And it was the arrival of print which was to prompt the growth of mass literacy. Because 
being a mass medium and being perceived or read by many actually depends on mass literacy. However, the need to read did not require the need to write, but in creating numberless copies of its written messages, print differed from the earlier mass medium of theatre by introducing a gap in time and space between the senders and the receivers. A public, live medium was superseded by a private, lifeless one whose receivers could withdraw into their own separate environments. A paradox thus arose which applied not only to print, but to most subsequent modes of mass communication, and which terms like mass and broadcasting in a way belie. For a while, these modes have enormously increased the size of an audience, but they have also atomized it, meaning they reduced it to small groups or isolated individuals who read or listen or watch in their own private spaces. The secondary phase is followed by the tertiary media phase, or the third phase that we will look at. In this phase, the person is not just sender, but also the receiver, and both sender and receiver require technical equipment in order to decipher the messages and in order to send the messages. It also goes hand in hand with increased commercialization. And the earliest developments we see in this tertiary media phase is photography and cinematography. The latter was a public medium in the sense that its audiences gathered in theatres. Although individual cinema audiences were no larger than theatrical audiences, film was much more of a mass medium than theatre, because the number of cinemas in which it was possible to show copies of a single film far extended the number of theatres which it was possible to tour a single dramatic performance. However, broadcasting was the first genuinely live mass medium since theatre, because it was instantaneous. Its messages were received by its audience at the very moment they were sent. They were not fixed messages in the form of printed texts. From 1922, radio transmitted live sounds to a private domestic audience. And from 1936, television provided the same kind of audience with a live sound and with moving pictures. As in the case of Print. The economic logic to all of these communications and technologies was to maximize their audiences, and to this end they resorted, wherever possible, to the modes of mass production. We could end the history of mass media right here, but I would propose that there is a fourth phase we could add to the history of mass media. And that fourth phase poses not only ever-increasing commercialization, but also breaks up the sender-receiver diet as senders become receivers and receivers become senders themselves. However, I will not go into much detail concerning this fourth phase. However, what I've just introduced is, of course, just a brief history of media, but it's not a history of broadcasting, so let's turn to broadcasting itself. And here I'm, of course, referring to British broadcasting in particular. British broadcasting, as we know it, basically starts bang in the 1920s, with the founding of the BBC in 1922. It brought with it a fair share of problems or difficulties, more likely, but also a number of advantages. On the latter point, the strangely privately public nature of broadcasting comes to mind. It is by hearing or watching events which are literally in public, such as major football matches, state funerals, or even general elections, that we gain a strong sense of participating in a collective and sometimes national experience. This helps to create a so-called imagined community, in which we certainly do not know every member, but we are still united by a deep horizontal comradeship, and whereby national co-fellows are sort of believed to constitute a bounded, natural entity. This comradeship, as well as its life character, also brought with it a few problems, as Scannell notes, mostly in terms of behaviour. For instance, Scannell asks, should domestic listeners stand during the national anthem, during sports events or state funerals? Did a conscientious Catholic fulfill her obligation to attend Sunday Mass if she watched it on television? This is why scholars sometimes insist on speaking of radio and television as public rather than private media, arguing that the social experiences of many people are only partly first-hand. The remainder are derived through radio and television, allowing 
allowing them to form an affinity with other people whom they are physically separate from and may never even meet. It has also been suggested that because broadcasting both domesticates the public sphere and socializes the private one, that it is neither public nor private in the traditional sense. Anyways, after that brief excourse, back to the 1920s. The BBC, or the British Broadcasting Company, was formed on the 18th October 1922 by a group of leading wireless manufacturers. That is not to mean that radio didn't exist beforehand, yet when we talk about the start of public broadcasting, 1922 is the year to look to. Beforehand, broadcasting was mostly used for military purposes. However, since the end of the First World War, it had become far harder for the British government to resist on military grounds, the pressure from both wireless manufacturers and amateur enthusiasts, and they were forced to authorize some kind of regular broadcasting service. And in 1920, the post office as the official licensor finally caved in. However, its start in the 1920s was a little mixed. As Raymond Williams points out, the situation was always complicated by the fact that the political authorities were thinking primarily of radio telephony, while the manufacturers were looking forward to broadcasting. When the Marconi company began broadcasting in 1920, there were complaints that this use for entertainment of what was primarily a commercial and transport control medium was frivolous and dangerous. And there was even a contemporary ban under pressure from radio telephonic interests and the armed forces. It wasn't until 1922 that the post office accepted a distinction between wireless technology, which addressed designated individuals, meaning point to point, and that which an addressed all and sundry that was basically broadcasting. In the same year, the Marconi company began regular broadcasts from Rittle and opened a London station known by its call sign 2LO. However, the post office refused to license any of the stations that cropped up on a permanent basis. And why is that? Whatever the political case for its regulatory role, the technological case was even stronger. There was only a limited number of frequencies on which broadcasting could take place without overcrowding the waveband. Europe accommodated over a dozen different countries, each speaking its own language and wanting its own broadcasting frequencies. As the mere offshore island of this cacophonic subcontinent, Britain would have to content itself with a very limited share of the waveband. The post office could not allow its few available frequencies to be permanently monopolized by only a handful of the manufacturers. Yet it had to accept that there would never be enough frequencies to license every manufacturer who wished to broadcast. Its solution, therefore, was to invite the leading firms, which were six large companies and several smaller ones, to form a broadcasting consortium. The service they collectively provided would stimulate the sales of the receivers they made, which the government would protect from foreign competition. As a result of this scheme, the manufacturers created the British Broadcasting Company, to which the post office granted a de facto, though never a de jure, monopoly. The BBC began transmission on the 14th of November 1922. The manufacturers guaranteed the company's solvency and its funds came from three different sources. The original stock, the royalties on the wireless sets which the manufacturers sold, and a share of the revenue from the broadcast receiving licenses which the post office collected from the listening public on the company's behalf. The BBC's first general manager was John Reith, a Scot of Calvinist upbringing. And when he applied for the post, he scarcely knew what broadcasting was. Yet he would go on to shape it according to a moral vision whose traces are still discernible even today. Reith soon came to the conclusion that broadcasting was in fact a precious national resource, too precious to be used merely to deliver audiences to advertisers or even to wireless manufacturers. It should instead be developed into a comprehensive public service, which was for him distinguished by five main characteristics. The first one was that it was aimed to broadcast to everyone in the country who wished to listen. The second, that it sought to maintain high standards to provide the best 
of everything. To achieve these two things, the public service system needed to, three, operate as a monopoly because competition would force it to abandon quality programs for minorities and simply seek to maximize its audience. Four, be funded by a license fee in order to ensure that the costs of the programs were not related to audience size. Both as an alternative to advertising revenue and as a sort of tax raised for a specific purpose, the license fee also allowed the system to achieve another aim alongside universality of provision and high standards of content. Because five, it needed to be institutionally and editorially independent of commercial pressures on the one hand and as far as possible government influence on the other. The British Broadcasting Company already possessed some of the characteristics of the public corporation when Reith joined in 1922. Perhaps because the government sensed straight away that broadcasting would be a cultural empty like public libraries or adult education classes. Wireless enthusiasts, and it was hoped the wider public, wanted a regular broadcasting service. But what should it consist of? The broadcasters were confronted, so to speak, with a blank sheet of paper. This new medium transmitted live sound, but not vision, to multitudes of separate, mostly domesticated individuals. But what could it do and what should it avoid? In its attempts to do news, drama, light entertainment and talk, it instinctively fell back on traditional forms. The newspaper, the stage, the lecture theater. Yet not always appropriately, because even content which seemed well suited to it would need adaption. For certain other things it attempted, such as sporting commentary for instance, there were no precedents. Broadcasting had to evolve on its own and it had to evolve and develop its own conventions. And not all of these would be successful in the long run. In the early years, broadcasts were made only for a few hours each day. And here I'm talking, of course, of radio broadcasts. Typically, transmissions might not begin until the afternoon and would conclude well before midnight. But they were varied. Since it seemed ideal for radio, there was music in abundance. Much of it, however, classical. Yet dance music, even though it was rather sedate by later standards, was often heard too. Yet even in music, the medium would often modify what it borrowed. Singing, for instance, had traditionally been a sonorous and public activity for which sincerity had not been a relevant criterion. But the microphone demanded a more intimate style of delivery, which even acquired its own name. That is crooning. And for all of you who read fanfiction, you might be familiar with that word. And since listeners were mostly alone, radio helped sincerity to acquire a new musical significance. Radio talks underwent a similar modification. The lecture, the sermon, the political speech all had rhetorical styles that spoke to audiences constituted as a crowd, a mass. But radio must speak to each listener as someone in particular. Once this was understood, talks became more frequent and covered a range of topics. While there were some light and humorous ones, many were serious and instructive, embracing such subjects as literature, film and drama. In 1924, Reith affirmed his belief in broadcasting's potential to teach and train the nation, approving the creation of a Central Education Advisory Committee to give guidance on school programs. These began in the same year as did talks in the sphere of adult education. Though varied and popular, this programming diet suffered from one serious deficiency. All too aware that in its coverage of current affairs, radio would prove itself much more fleet than Fleet Street. The Newspaper Proprietors Association put pressure on the government to forbid any news broadcast until 7pm. Even then, the company was obliged to take its news from the main agencies, such as, for instance, Reuters. And this was supplied in the form of bulletins, which had evidently been drafted with newspaper readers rather than radio listeners in mind. In its first years as a news medium, radio was obliged to declare it was a prisoner of the press. This is London calling to LO calling. The newsreader would intone, though not before 7pm. 
Here is the first general news bulletin, copyrighted by Reuters Press Association, Exchange Telegraph and Central News. There followed a dry, very sedate bulletin of 20 or 25 minutes with no interviews, features or actuality. While the general strike signified the first strike of liberation, so to speak, it was not until 1938 that the restrictions on the supply of the news and the ban on political commentary was finally thrown off. The Second World War hailed a new era for the BBC, as bulletins were heard before 6 p.m. Um, and the BBC secured the permission and right to edit and write its own bulletins from the agency material on which it still largely relied. Nonetheless, since the BBC's inception, the country took to sound broadcasting with boundless enthusiasm. Those of you who have read um, D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover might know that Clifford is an absolute radio enthusiast, spending more time fiddling with his radio instead of caring for his wife. During the mid-1920s, houses in towns and cities began to sprout aerials like strange new vegetation. In 1923, the post office issued 80,000 licenses, but in 1924 these jumped up to a million, a figure which doubled over the next three years. By 1939, 9 million wireless receivers were under license. In the late 1920s, in 1927 to be precise, the British Broadcasting Company became the British Broadcasting Corporation, a publicly funded yet quasi autonomous organization whose constitution and obligations have remained largely unchanged since then. It was established by a royal charter, with a board of governors to whom Sir John Reith was accountable as director general. Although the charter determines the corporation's structure, its activities are regulated by a license and agreement which are conferred by the government. It was, and it is, obliged to inform to educate and to entertain, to report the proceedings of Parliament, to provide a political balance and in a national emergency to broadcast government messages. It may neither editorialize nor carry advertising. This has of course changed over the past decades. However, back then its income was mostly guaranteed from broadcast receiving licenses and it strove to maintain a position of editorial independence, something which it still strives for today. However, it has never been entirely free from state pressure, of course. It is a public broadcasting company. Its license to broadcast has always been granted for fixed periods, never in perpetuity. The state appoints its board of governors and the state, not the BBC, determines the cost of the receiving license, part of which it may actually withhold. Hence, throughout its history, the BBC's relations with governments of all political hues have always been delicate and occasionally absolutely strained. There were of course also other growing pains from personal dislikes between Reith and the Board of Governors to the rapid expansion of staff and its consequent change in relationship between them to the persistent criticisms that the corporation was being rather undemocratic and elitist in its programming to the way in which administrative and technical considerations could override editorial, creative and even audience needs. The BBC in its early days struggled, even through its rapid expansion. The Second World War and its preceding years, however, crystallized a few turning points for the BBC. Turning points, for instance, like the first Royal Christmas Message in 1932, which constituted the auspicious start of a tradition that still persists to this very day. As well as, for instance, the radio rendering and coverage of George V's last illness, with John Reith himself coming to the microphone to announce the king's death. The royal funeral was also broadcast, and the abdication statement made 11 months later by the new king, Edward VIII, was much more compelling to listen to than to read. Moreover, 1934 saw the first successful demonstration of electronic television, to which Isaac Schoenberg only noted, well, gentlemen, you have now invented the biggest time waster of all time. Use it well. 
That is not to mean that television simply suddenly came into being in the 1930s. Development on television had already started alongside radio in the 1920s, with the first television set, the Octagon, being made in 1928. From then on, development continued. However, it was in 1936 that the BBC's television service opened, a development that was completely halted by the outbreak of the war in 1939. According to Roy Arms, however, it was not the first regular TV service in the world. The Germans had actually begun theirs in March 1935, but since the latter was only transmitting 180 line pictures, the BBC could nonetheless secure the spot as the first broadcaster in the world to provide a regular, high-definition television service. While the BBC had gained importance in the pre-war years, the war cemented its leading role as a public broadcasting service and as an important cultural and social institution in Britain. To keep up the spirits of the British and their allies, as well as those of the people of occupied Europe, broadcasting became a patriotic duty and even a human imperative. As such, the BBC saw fundamental changes in programme-making practice, for instance by live reporting from battle scenes, and it became a fundamental source of propaganda news to the free world. After the war, radio still took precedence over TV. In fact, between 1945 and about 1960, BBC Radio enjoyed what was probably its greatest era. Television in comparison was viewed with more let's call it ambiguity. An ambiguity that television, both as a set and in terms of programming, in a way reflected. On the one hand, because it was a new, expensive and not altogether reliable medium, there was a tendency to regard it as frivolous, a toy for the rich. As Stuart Hood puts it, pre-war television was aimed at a small and affluent audience in London and the home counties, which had not been affected by the depression and mass unemployment. In the South East, prosperity based on the boom in building and light industry and in consumer goods like refrigerators and radios and the car industry financed the purchase of sets. The programs the viewers wanted were dominated by the concept of the West End show of the revenue and the kind of entertainment which was the middle-class audience's idea of a night out. Television broadcasting resumed in 1946, initially to about 15,000 households. Bolstered by a new combined radio and TV license, priced two pounds back then, the service began to grow. In 1949, it was extended to the West Midlands and in 1951 to Manchester and in the following year to parts of Scotland, Wales and the West. By 1954, the BBC was broadcasting about six hours of television a day, most of it back then live. Whereas television slowly evolved from an expensive luxury to being commercially available for British homes, it also faced a bit of backlash. In fact, probably quite a bit of it. There was the familiar opposition to a new medium, of course, from controllers of old media and cultural genres. A boycott of television was variously imposed by the British film industry, the music halls, and the West End theatre managers, as well as the controlling bodies of boxing and football. But the more pressing problems came from within the BBC, because for some time there was little understanding within the BBC of television's potential. Indeed, it is very hard to avoid the conclusion that during this period the corporation was basically in two minds about the medium. On the one hand, the BBC was the monopoly broadcaster and it felt that it should naturally assume responsibility for what was a new kind of broadcasting. On the other hand, however, as a culturally conservative body, the BBC did not really warm to its task. And Grace Whitnam Goldie describes the broadcaster's dilemma as such. She says, their speciality was the use of words. They had no knowledge of how to present either entertainment or information in vision, nor any experience of handling visual material. Moreover, most of them distrusted the visual. They associated vision with the movies and the music hall, and they were afraid that the high purposes of the corporation would be trivialized by the influence of those concerned with what could be transmitted in visual terms. 
The post-war director general, William Haley, shared that misunderstanding and dislike of television, which had also characterized his predecessor, John Reith. Just as before the war, Reith had thought of integrating radio and television, Haley insisted in 1949 that television was merely an extension to sound broadcasting and that television and radio were actually sides of the same coin. We, with hindsight, of course, know that radio's success story eventually ends and that television expands and prevails. And some scholars cite the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II in 1953 as the inciting incident that would propel television into the upper echelons of mass media. The coronation is, and I quote, widely regarded as having been the first ever media event, in the sense that although not created or prompted by television, it seemed tailor-made for the medium and was the first event to be watched and enjoyed in many parts of the world. It was recorded as it was televised, and the films were then flown for rapid rebroadcasting to Canada, the United States, and elsewhere. The BBC's coverage, for which it gained permission only after delicate negotiations with both the church and the state, was impressive even by today's standards. Beginning with the service in Westminster Abbey, on which a hushed, reverential commentary was supplied, it continued with the procession to Buckingham Palace, which was covered by cameras at every vantage point along the way and by a slew of commentators. Some 56% of the nation watched the service, with 53% watching the procession. In of itself, the coronation prompted an increase in the sales of television sets, and in 1953 was the first year in which more television than radio sets were actually manufactured. However, the coronation simply hastened along a trend that had been ongoing before. In 1951, nearly three quarters of a million television licenses were issued. And in 1955, viewing began to exceed listening for the first time. And, and by 1958, nine million licenses were held. Notably, the post-war years lauded a new era for the BBC. And not all of these developments were necessarily positive for the BBC. The Beveridge Report of 1949 and 19, uh, to 1951 noted that though waveband scarcity affected radio and television, it could nonetheless accommodate two national competitors for the BBC, because before that the BBC held the absolute monopoly on broadcasting whatsoever. While the monopoly of the BBC was still recommended in the Beveridge Report, it was not without criticisms and safeguards were also similarly recommended to be introduced. The report also opposed the introduction of advertising into the BBC's programmes. However, the report was unfortunately made more or less redundant by the incoming Conservative government. Yet it had still an influence on the BBC, because it alerted the BBC of the danger of advertising and its potential influence on programming, and it disapproved of the Londonization of the BBC, a focal point that, for instance, ITV, one of the uh, BBC's first competitors, used as an inspiration for their more regional structure and setup. Another threat to the BBC's monopoly was the renewal of the process of, of democratization that had been gathering pace before the war, a movement that proclaimed to let the people decide for themselves in terms of broadcasting and programming. And Briggs points out that in its evidence to beverage, the Incorporated Society of Advertisers had suggested that it might be advisable to have a network which the public did not associate with a semi official service. But criticism also came from within. A former director general noted that freedom is choice and monopoly of broadcasting is inevitably the negation of freedom, no matter how efficiently it is run. There was a growing democratic revulsion against someone else knowing best, and people started to crave diversity 
and choice. And the third and least obvious challenge to the monopoly, yet perhaps the most powerful, was economic in nature. After the hardships of the war and the post-war years, the nation was once again on the verge of prosperity. More goods were being made and there was more money to buy them with. And with more economic power and affluence came the need to advertise these goods, advertisements that would be well suited for television and vice versa. By the mid-1950s, the BBC had changed their tune on advertisement and televised its first ad. What follows is a narrative of growth and expansion. From the 1950s onwards, television and broadcasting grew exponentially, with television's eventual ability to screen cinema films and to record its own material, changing the way in which the medium was perceived. With this change in perception and an ever-growing audience, programming similarly began to change. It had to change. Not only was screen time extended and an increasing proportion of the material that television was transmitting being pre-recorded, but the programs itself transformed. On the one hand, pre-recording meant that the aesthetic and narrative quality could be improved by editing, location usage and different forms of assembling scenes. Moreover, pre-recording afforded repetition of well-liked programs, as well as the storage of programs. As a result of this, recorded programs also acquired the status of commodities or tradable goods. It was not just the old movie studios that could sell tailor-made films to television, but TV broadcasters could buy and sell TV programs among themselves, something else which helped to broaden the program base of British television. On the other hand, longer screen times meant that programs needed to adapt to that, for instance by supplementing longer movies with serialized formats, some, if not most of which, still shape our TV landscapes today. Yet it is even today important to remind ourselves that television remains essentially life, in the sense that reception is instantaneous with the transmission of even pre-recorded content. Indeed, we may feel that the programs which best express the nature of the medium are actually those which are the least susceptible to pre-recording, whose value depends on their up-to-dateness or topicality that is, news, even though it usually contains film sequences, uh, current affairs or outside broadcasts, especially those of sport. And if we go back to the last video um, on the time that we spend watching TV and which programs we use, as well as back to your comments on which programs you are actually consuming, News and live broadcasts have not lost their importance. In fact, in current times, with the pandemic still ongoing, it could be argued that live broadcasting has enjoyed an upswing in popularity due to its alacrity and its reliability. Before... Do not touch the microphone first rule of pre-recording. Do not touch it. Before offering an account... This kann doch jetzt nicht wahr sein. Ja, ja, das kann ja nicht funktionieren, wenn ich äh, das, äh, den Bluetooth, äh, das Bluetooth-Zeug da nicht angemacht habe, nicht wahr? Warum rede ich eigentlich wie Helge Schneider? Oh Gott. Now, what is broadcasting? What is television? And, and uh, I briefly have to clean up my background. Oh god, I hate pre-recording. Reith soon came to the conclusion that broadcasting was a precious natural, <laughs> natural resource. Spending more time fiddling with his radio than fiddling with his wife? Wait, no, I can't say that.